This morning, I will share four important truths about how do we know that we know him? How do we make certain that we are having a fellowship with God? Number one thing that I want to share is the essentials of fellowship. 1 John 1, 4 says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. The, the essentials of our fellowship is to love God and to love one another. We can sum up all the commandments in the Word of God to two. Love God and love one another. When we do this, that is the most basic foundation of having fellowship with God. You cannot have fellowship with God if you don't love Him and if you don't love your neighbor. I'm not saying it. Jesus says it in the Gospels. Because people were... Thought they were smarter than Jesus, and they asked him, Well, which of all the commandments is greater? Jesus was so key in outlining the essence of our relationship with God, and he said, Love the Lord thy God with all your strength, with all your mind, with every ounce of who you are and what you have, and love your neighbor. That is the essentials. Of fellowship. Nothing is greater. Nothing is more powerful than loving God and loving one another. But it doesn't remain at that. It's, that is only the entry point into a life of fellowship with God. Now, how many couples do we have here this morning? Anybody that is married or has been married for a couple of years? I see a couple of hands here and there. Any and all relationships require an investment of time and energy and devotion and love and nurturing in order to be successful. In our relationship with God, it is no different. We need to nourish that relationship to make it blossom and to make it thrive and to make it worth our while. What is the energy or what is it that we need in order to help our relationship and our fellowship with God thrive and be strengthened? That's point number two that I want to share this morning. The energy of our fellowship is God is light. Now, it is important because we have a dark place this morning. How fitting. But when you turn up the light, there is heat. There is movement. How many of us have seen an incubator? Do we, does, does everyone know what an incubator is? You know when a chicken lays an egg, that egg needs heat. And a lot of the times we don't have chickens uh, incubating their eggs, right? But they put those eggs in a light, and that light is giving that egg heat and in time that light is turning into life inside that egg our energy in our fellowship with god is god himself as light pastor what does it say that thank you for asking we're going to re read it right now this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you god is light in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another 
And here's a key point that I want you to remember and outline in your, in your booklet. In the blood of Jesus, his son purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us all from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. There are two key components that will strengthen your relationship and your fellowship with God. That is his light, that it is made possible by the blood of Jesus. Look at me for one second. We need to make the blood of Jesus, we need to take a hold of that blood of Jesus and smear the lives of our children, of our marriages, of our homes. And you say, Pastor, that sounds kind of gory. Sounds kind of, ugh, smear the blood of Jesus. How important is the blood? I don't know if, about you, but I grew up in the church. And the, we used to sing a song, there is power, power, wonder-working power. And we used to sing about the blood of Jesus. My friends, you need the power of the blood of Jesus. If you, if you don't take claim in the hold of the power in the name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus, you will not be able to walk in the light. And you will not be able to walk in the light because you will live in sin. Now you say, Pastor, what are you talking about? Because I make mistakes every once in a while. I know you do, and so do I. But when I am covered by the blood of Jesus, the Bible says that he cleanses us and he purifies us from sin so we can live in the light. Amen? Now, if anybody says here, well, I haven't sinned, Pastor, you're a liar. If you say, Pastor, I'm a really good person. I'm only 12 years old. I'm a nice kid. Liar. All of us have sinned. The Bible says all of us have sinned and have fallen short from the glory of God. And in, in John 8, 12, you may want to write this down. John 8, 12 says, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And he who comes to me will find that light. And that light leads to life. All of us need the life of Christ strengthening us and giving us the power to live in fellowship with God. Now, our fellowship, our fellowship with God is weakened, number one, when we ignore the light. We read that right there. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. Have you ever met a Christian or a believer that says, oh, no, 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 I, I, I'm, a, I'm a believer. I believe in Christ. But then you see the way they live. You see the way they walk. Can you see me? I know there's not a light here and I'm kind of dark, so at least you can see my mouth moving, right? <laughs> if we say that we are in the light, but we ignore the light and we live in the darkness, that will weaken our fellowship with God. We, we cannot ignore the light of Christ. That's why when people commit a sin, they stop having fellowship with other believers. Because there's something that comes out. There's something that you say, oh, there's something wrong with that brother. There's something wrong with that sister. Because if we are in the light, we expose when there's darkness in the lives of others. We cannot ignore the light. Number two, we cannot deny sin. Ever met someone that said, no, 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 I'm not, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Nah, we see, we see, we see what happens. We see what happens. John is being, being very clear. A lot of them people back in the day, they were so religious, they thought they never sinned. They were perfect. They were spotless, blameless. John had already settled that. We all have sinned. We all have flaws. We all can stumble. 
But the third one is the one that, in my opinion, is perhaps the most dangerous one when we rationalize sin. Because we are living in dangerous times, and thank you for that conference we're going to have about culture and identity. But we're living in a time when people are saying, no, this is right, when it is in complete opposition to what the Word of God says. And what, what, what's interesting to me, and Leo, you have a, a tall order with the youth, because I know the youth are more incisive than the older folks that I have here. Because the youth are being lied to by a system that tells them, no, this is the right way, and it is in, in direct opposition to the Word of God. But we've come to rationalize sin as being okay, as being tolerant. Church, if we are going to be having fellowship, the right fellowship with God, I say this in the most loving way, we cannot be tolerant with sin. We will, love, we will love all people that walk in through those doors. Okay? Is that clear? But when something is sin, we need to call it out as what it is. Sin, and it's not God-pleasing. We cannot be tolerant. We cannot rationalize sin. Because we stand on the side of righteousness because we have fellowship with God and we live in the light. But if, if sin makes you wonder, if you're thinking, Pastor, I am dealing with sin, I'm struggling. John writes with his hand on his heart this next portion, and it is the beginning of, of chapter 2. It says, my dear children, I write to you, and, and let, me put, let me put your name here, my dear CFC. I write this to you so that you will not sin, but if Anybody, CFC, does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. When you and I, or even your children, commit a sin, we have... We have an advocate before the Father. We have someone who is fighting on our behalf before the Father because he paid the price. He is the atonement for our sins. With that, we can live. That's why Paul wrote so adamantly and with such conviction in Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, we, are, we know the essentials of fellowship, which is to love God and to love one another. We know also that there's an energy of our fellowship. We have the light of Christ living in us. But if you have fellowship, then there must be also an evidence of this fellowship. There must be evidence for our fellowship. Let me read this to you. Saying I know him and knowing him are two very different things. In fact, the early church, in the early church, we had a faction of believers that become so enlightened that they base their knowledge of God on a mere intellectual experience. You know somebody like that? That they think they know so much that they are better than everyone else. We had such a group in this early church. They thought that their fellowship with God was based on only on this cognitive way, in this intellectual manner. They become so engrossed in knowledge and mysticism, they believe that anything physical or material was essentially evil. The problem was that this belief system had infiltrated the church and divided the early church. John, who walked hand in hand with the word of life, who had witnessed the glory of the Son of God, feels compelled to write a defense of the gospel that he, so, that he so passionately has shared with all the world. He begins this by telling us of a personal knowledge of the Son of God, and his argument circles are on the title of this morning's teaching, which is, How Can I Know That I Know Him? See, I've known people who could who could barely read the Bible, but who had 
and the incredible fellowship with God. And everything they knew about God was because my father would preach to them the gospel of Christ. You know my dad was a pastor, right? And my dad insisted they learn how to read. And they learn how to read by beginning to read the word of God. Isn't that a beautiful thing? So the first, the first phrases or the first sentences they read was, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. What am I saying this morning? Our knowledge, it is crucial, but it is not the determining point that will make us have the right fellowship with God. John is asking this people, do you know him personally? Do you know him in such a way that it changes every aspect and every crack and crevice in your life? Look at 1 John verses 2, 3, and 4. We know, and here's the proof, we know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. You can say you know him all you want. You can say you know him until you turn purple, but if you don't obey his commands, you don't know the Son of God. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, don't get mad at me. This is, not, this, is, this is another Juanito, not this Juanito. He says, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. John is saying very passionately, if you say you know him, but if you don't follow his commands, you are lying not only to me, but you're lying to yourself. But John, look at John verses 2, 5, and 6. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. How did... Mija, me das mi agüita, por favor. How do we know? What's the evidence? Thank you, my amor. Thank you. What's the evidence... Of having fellowship with God. Who is the best example of having fellowship with God? Who could set the standard for how we can tell that someone is having fellowship with God? May I suggest to you the person of Jesus Christ? May I suggest to you that he is our best example on how to have the right fellowship with God, how to have the right evidence and he did two things that I want to outline to you this morning. Number one is a life of obedience. The Bible says that he was obedient. And I'm going to say in Spanish and I'm going to translate. Obediente hasta la muerte y muerte de cruz. He was obedient until the point of death and death on a cross. Anything that the Father said... Jesus was willing to do it. If we claim to have fellowship with God, we must be obedient. John, now, when you say, well, pastor, I, I want to be obedient, but I am struggling. John, the apostle John, is not saying, A, that we can know God by attempting to keep his commandments. Because a lot of people before Christ try to keep every commandment of the law, and they failed miserably. Have you ever tried to keep the commandments in your own strength? And Have you ever failed miserably? So you cannot have fellowship with God attempting to do it in your own strength. See, obedience is the evidence of our salvation, not the way we attain our salvation. I know so many people that have tried to gain their salvation by trying to be obedient, not understanding that we cannot get salvation in our own obedience, it is received by grace. It is the only way that we can get salvation by grace and not by our own attempts. The second thing about obedience that John is telling us is that we will never struggle with disobedience again. Okay? I've been serving God. I was baptized at the age of 17. And ever since I've been baptized, 
Every day, listen, every day is a struggle. He said, you're a pastor. You went to Bible school. You've done so many things. We struggle. As long as you live in this body that is made of flesh and bone, you will face struggles. John is not saying that if you are going to be obedient, you are going to be perfect. It's, he's not saying, he's telling you, I'm not saying you're not going to have a struggle with disobedience. In fact, in fact, being obedient is a struggle. How many of you have children and you tell your children you need to make your bed and you need to take out the trash? How many times do they obey on the first, one, on the first try? human nature it takes a while and listen and don't you think parents that even when they do it on the inside they're fighting against it human nature to obey is a struggle you are no different but if we are to have fellowship with God we're going to do it diligently because we know it is the evidence of our faith what what John is saying is that that struggle became, becomes less intense, number one, when the lordship issues are resolved. Who deserves to be number one in your life? When I realize that Lord Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, the ruler of my life, numero uno in mi vida, then it becomes easier to be obedient to what God commands. And then second thing that I want you to know is that when we settle the love issues, who do I desire to be number one? Now, I've talked with young people before, and sometimes they tell me, Pastor, I want to do the right thing, but my desires tell me otherwise. And now, I know when you were young, you probably thought like that. The thing is, the older you get, your, your desires change, your preferences change. But the one thing that we must always be on, on the lookout is, who do I desire to love the most in my life? And, the, and if you're married, you say, well, pastor, I need to love my wife above all things. I'm going to suggest to you that you love God more than your wife. And wives, don't get, don't get, I'm getting some, some piercing eyes right now up here. Wives, if he loves God more than he loves you, it will be better for you. Because even when he doesn't feel like loving you, he needs to love you because he loves God. Is, is that making sense? It behooves us to love God above everything. Because when, when we align our heart with the desires that God has for us, it will be easier to be obedient to God. And being obedient, it is important because letter A, it validates love. John writes, we know that we've come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But if any obeys, anyone obeys his word, God's God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Letter B, not only does it validate our love, it validates our relationship with God. Right? We just read it. This is how we know we are in him. And letter C, it develops our love. It says that anyone obeys his word, verse 5, God's love is truly made complete in him. And look at what Charles Spurgeon writes in this sentence that is stated in your outline. A life that does not change is a signal of an impure heart. Church, if we are to have fellowship with God, and if we are to have a pure heart, we need to seek the change and the transformation that is coming as we have fellowship with Him. Now, the second evidence of fellowship is loving one another. I'm not going to read verses 7 through 11, but I do want to read verses 9 through 11. Can you put them on the screen, please? The, because the second component or the second evidence of fellowship is love for one another. 
And it says, anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. I know that there's people that you don't like. I know there's people that they're hard to love. Pastor Ledesma says, don't look at them right now. Don't turn around and look at anyone. But there's people that are difficult to love. Do you have one in your life? Right? We all do. But look at what verse 10 says. Well, whoever loves his brother lives in the light, and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. Whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. He does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded him. I know that this is not new to you. CFC, we are a church that we've been taught well by our pastor. We know that loving our brothers and sisters is the most powerful evidence that we know him, right? But we also realize that it is difficult to love our neighbor as ourselves. It is not easy. Whom I know that we have bosses that are difficult to love, right? That boss that is just a pain in the neck, he's difficult to love. But God commands us to love people. God commands us to love people in spite of who they are. But it is difficult to love our neighbor as ourselves. But the second part of this commandment, it is more difficult to love others as Christ loves them. How, how does Christ love people? So much, so much that he gave his life on the cross for them. The Bible says that Christ loved the church so much that he was willing to give himself for the church. Now, it is a great challenge to love our neighbors, but it is a greater challenge to love them as Christ loves them. Because you know that there's people that talk bad about you. There's people that have perhaps betrayed you. There's people that have turned their backs on you when you needed them the most. That have, there's people that have walked out when you needed them to be there, to stand there when you were going through that struggle. I, I know that it's difficult to love them. Nevertheless, the Bible commands us to love them. See, it is not what happens to you, but what happens in you that matters. When you obey God and when you love the people that God has placed in your life, it is the most powerful evidence that you have fellowship with God, that you know him the way he wants you to know him. Let me give you a word of assurance found in John 2, 12 to 14. It says, I am writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you know the father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God lives in you. And you have overcome the evil one. In this passage, I see three kinds of people. I see children, I see fathers, and I see young men or young people. See, number one, as children, we are to experience God's forgiveness. And you say, why, why do we need that? Because when we are born into the family of Christ, we come as children of God. And we need that forgiveness so we can blossom and we can do what God has called us to do, right? In verse 12, it says, Dear children, your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. But not only that, but let's go to the second thing, the group of people that I see. As fathers, we experience God's intimacy. Now, intimacy is an evidence of our fellowship with God where there's something special that happens when you're a mature believer. I told you I was saved when I was 17. And I think that when I was 17, I had this incredible passion that I used to take my Bible to school, right? But I can tell you one thing that now, it's been, it's been a while since I've been saved and baptized, but now I think I am more mature. Now I am a father. And I think I'm a father, obviously, of four children that are, well, three children that are here, one that is somewhere else. But I think now as a father, 
I am more mature in my walk with God. And I have learned to have intimacy with God. It's different. It is different than when I was 17 years old. There's something more unique that we cherish and that we relish when we are having our intimacy and our fellowship with God. I think that's why it is so important that we understand this passage because he's talking about children. He's talking about fathers. He's talking about different levels of maturity. Nevertheless, the fellowship is there, but there's different levels. And there's a third group of people, which is the young men, which is a lot of young people in this place, because we experience God's power. Oh, if I had the energy and the stamina that I had when I was 17 years old. Combine, okay, amen, right? Amen. But I'm evolving. But if you are young, the evidence of your fellowship with God is power. See, I, I, let's stand up for a second. I, I, you know who this guy is, right? You say, no clue. He is our youth group leader. Man, let's give it up for Leo. So if you have youth, if you have young people that are struggling, if you're a parent and you say, well, I have this teenager that I'm struggling with, there's your help right there. Okay? Your job is to help our youth walk in fellowship with God that all this energy they have, it transforms them to walk a life of power in the Holy Spirit. It's a big thing to do. You're not going to do it alone. You're going to do it with the help of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Take your seat, please. Okay? <laughs> Didn't mean to put you on the spot, but I wanted people to know who you are. Because just like you are a young man that relies on the power of God, we're asking all the young people to walk in the power of God. Because that is the evidence of the fellowship that we have with Christ. Pastor, what does it say that in the Bible? Ah, hold on. I knew you were going to ask. I write to you, John 2, 14, because you are strong and the word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. You say, Pastor, I'm struggling. Pastor, you don't know what I'm going through. John is being prophetic in what he's writing. He's saying, look, I've already seen you will overcome the evil one. You will succeed where I place you because it is not up to your own strength. It is in the might and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Young people, you better believe this. You better believe that God has something to do with you. Lastly, let me give you the enemy of our fellowship. Because if everything is going right, if everything that God has done for us is for, for our own benefit, we must know that there is an enemy that wants us to fail, that wants us to stumble. And then 1 John 2, 15 and 17, do not, can you say out loud, do not, You need to have some burritos before you come to church, okay? Do not. Yeah. There you go. I had my Mexican energy bar this morning. I had a burrito de chicharrón. It was delicious. Do not. Do not love the world or anything in the world. For if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does not come from the Father, but from the world. The world and his desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. What is the world? Pastor, am I supposed to live in a different planet? No, 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 no. We live in the world, but we are not of this world. Now, the world is referenced in different passages in the Bible. For example, in John 1.10, the Bible there, the word, the, world, the word world refers to the universe, which is the physical planet that we live in, right? It says he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Then in John 3.16, it says, for God so loved thee, for God so loved thee, world, in that passage, the world is referring to, the, to mankind, the human race. It's a different word, different meaning of the word world. But in this passage, in John 2, 15 through 17, is referring to the world's 
system. You and I know there's a system in the world that opposes anything that is God. In fact, I was telling you to Mayela, I believe that the spirit of the Antichrist is already at work in our society. How many agree to that? Yeah, it is. Because you can claim any religion, any God is okay. The moment you say Jesus Christ, am I right? Am I, you can say anything about any other God. And, and if you're from a different religion or a different God, listen, I'm not trying to disrespect you. I respect you. That, that is your thing. How can I say this? Do you know that the gospel has a certain level of offense built into it, right? The gospel is offensive sometimes. And I say, I'm going to step down for a little bit. Because I need to teach you this because you will be facing this in school or at work. I don't want to say that my God is better than your God. Can you, can you lift up his name? Amen. <laughs> For there is no other name given unto men under the heavens by which we can be saved, but only the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We will never be ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for anyone who believes. My friends, all the other gods have tried and they have failed. The only one that gave his blood to save us, his name is Jesus Christ. We don't need to be disrespectful. We need to be loving. We need to speak the truth in love. But there is only one God and there is a spirit. There is a world system that is anti-Christ. That is coming against the name that you and I lift up every Sunday. And we say, there's no other name like the name of Jesus. But if we are to have fellowship with God, we need to be... We need to be cognizant of the fact that there is an enemy that wants to make you fail, that wants to break that fellowship. Well, there's three things that characterize the world. Number one is the lust of the flesh, which is our sinful nature. It is to live a life. Let me read this to you. I found this. I love it. I, I just copy and paste it. And it was in chat GPT, okay? It is to live a life. Dominate. What is, the, what is the lust of the flesh? It is to live a life dominated by the senses. It is to be gluttonous in food, slavish in pleasure, lustful and lax in morals, selfish in the use of possessions, regardless of all the spiritual values, extravagant in the gratification of material desires. The lust of the flesh is regardless of the commandments of God, the judgment of God, the standards of God, and the very existence of God. That is the lust of the flesh. John says, run as far as you can. The second thing that John tells us to stay away from the world, do not love the world, it is the lust of the eyes, which is the temptation around us. There's so much of it nowadays. C.H. Dodd says, it is a tendency to be captivated by outward show. It is a spirit which believes that happiness is to be found in the things which money can buy and the eye can see. It has no values other than the material. It concerns me because a lot of our younger people are being lured by the enemy of our souls because of the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. We've become a society that is entangled with this behavior. And the third thing that John is telling us, it is the pride of life, which is an attitude of arrogance. Now, who is this person? This is a person whose conversation is a continual boasting about things which he does not possess all his, in all his life is spent in an attempt to impress everyone he meets with his own non-existent importance. My friends, I'm wrapping up this morning. And let me tell you one thing. If we are to have fellowship with God, we need to be able to have discernment and see those who love the world more than Christ. 
A, it's the kind of people that the love of the world and the love of the Father are incompatible. You cannot love the world and love God. You cannot, Jesus said, you cannot serve two masters. For you will love one and despise the other. And Paul also tells us that we cannot be a friend of the world because we constitute ourselves enemies of God. Now, you may ask this morning, what am I supposed to do with my friends that I have? What am I supposed to do with the friends that I hang out and watch the UFC fights every weekend? What am I going to do with the friends that I go and play soccer with on the weekends, Pastor? Am I supposed to not have fellowship with them? All the contrary. Your fellowship with God should be a light so strong in you that others are attracted to it. We are to be such a light in the world that so desperately needs the love and the light of Christ. But we must also be able to understand that there are people that do not understand that loving the world and loving God are incompatible. And the second thing, second observation, is that the only way to receive the best God has for us is to let go. Let me give you this example. If I... If your hands were full with two loaves of bread, okay? And I'm assuming you're not, you're not a vegan, okay? Disclaimer, I'm hoping you're not a vegan. No, I don't think anybody is. But if you have two loaves of bread, okay, and your hands are full, but then if I tell you, look, I have a T-bone steak cooked medium well, and I say, I want to give it to you. And you say, Pastor, my hands are already full. I can't give it to you. You have to let it go and get the T-bone steak. Some of the best things that God has in store for you, you need to let go of what you have right now. A lot of us have become so focused on what we have that we don't let it go for the good things. We don't let go of the good things because we don't see the best things that God has in store for us. Let me tell, let me read you this and I'll wrap up with this. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. The house, the car, the job, the checking account, the sneakers, the shirt, the glasses, everything's going to pass away. Only, only the one who does the will of God will live forever. I'm going to ask you to please stand to your feet. Jim Elliott, an incredible missionary who laid his very own life for the sake of the gospel, says this, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Church, the reason why we gather every Sunday is to lead you into a closer fellowship with Christ. My desire this morning is that you realize every key component of our relationship so you can develop this walk with Him, that you walk with Him in the light, and there is no darkness in you. Can I pray for you this morning? Can I pray that the Holy Spirit just opens your eyes and you can see the light in whatever circumstance you may be going through, that you will say, Pastor Juan, I want to live in close fellowship with God. I don't want it to be an intellectual knowledge. I want to know Him the way I ought to know Him. Can I pray for you this morning? Father, thank you for CFC. Thank you for every person under the sound of my voice that desires from the bottom of their hearts to walk in close fellowship with you. I pray 
that we are empowered by your Holy Spirit to love you and to love our neighbors. I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, Father, we can display the evidence of who you are, that we have this energy to live day by day, empowered by your Holy Spirit, that we become contagious about our faith, that we are obedient in everything and anything that you call us to do, that we love people the way you love them, God, that we become intolerant with sin, but we become gracious with grace. And I ask you, Father, that you take our eyes away from the system of this world, that we can set our hearts on what is eternal, and that we walk with our hopes set on the price that we have reserved for us in glory. Thank you for every family. Thank you for every father, every mother, every child in this place. And we worship you, Father, for what you've given us to your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose we name we pray. Amen. And amen. God love you. God bless you.